here. It was a femur of Samothirium, one of the giraffes with a short neck that lived on Samos. From that point on, his fascination with bones grew. Salunius went on to study paleontology at the University of Colorado, learning to reconstruct animals and their environments from the clues found in fossil remains. In 1973, he returned to Samos as a graduate student to finish what he had begun more than 20 years before, creating an inventory of every type of fossil found in the bone beds of Samos. His study, published eight years later, particularly intrigued one reader, folklorist and scholar Adrian Mayer, and she had a question for Salunius. How would these fossil beds have appeared to the ancients some 2,000 years before? It would have been very easy for them to, to find bones without really searching like a professional paleontologist today because there are thousands of small faults going through the island and they make little steps, natural steps, which is a natural excavation in a way. The Samos bone beds were once thick with fossils. In just the last two centuries, some 60,000 specimens have been removed from an area no larger than two square miles. In 1839, paleontologists just descended on Greece and dug up great amounts of Miocene and Pleistocene bones, and they took them back to their museum. This site doesn't really contain very many more fossils right now. So in order to study the fossils from here, one has to go to museums. The specimens have been spread all over the world. There are fossils in Vienna, in uh, Budapest, in Paris, in London, in New York, in, at Yale, at Harvard, at the Smithsonian in Washington, D.C., and so on. Salunius documented that, at one time, Samos was one of the most prolific fossil sources in the world, yielding 72 different prehistoric species, including remains of mastodons, mammoths, and woolly rhinoceros from the Miocene era some seven million years ago. And there are more more species of mammals found here than all the plains of Africa together. So actually, there are some indications that it could have been a migratory route of animals. With such rich deposits of fossils literally under their feet, didn't the ancients wonder about their origins? Classical scholars and historians who had studied the ancient record found no mention of fossil bones, but Mayer instinctively felt they had to be there. The ancient Greeks must have found remains from the Pleistocene era in, in the mainland Greece whenever they dug wells, whenever they plowed their fields. To prove her theory, Mayer took her investigation to the library of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, where she pored over the accounts of ancient scholars, many of them obscure and rarely examined. Over the course of a year, she found dozens of Greek and Roman references to fossil bones. But how had generations of scholars missed them? One reason, perhaps, was that the most celebrated and well-known scientific thinkers of the ancient world, such as Aristotle and Thucydides, were silent on the subject of vertebrate fossils. Instead, it was in the seldom-read writings of less famous but equally learned scribes and scholars that Mayer found the richest evidence, cloaked in references to ancient mythology. They talked about giants, monsters, heroes. They didn't refer to them as prehistoric fossil bones. They didn't refer to them in scientific terms, of course. Once Mayer stripped away the mythological trappings, she found dispassionate, almost clinical evidence. Among the most startling was a long-forgotten account by the Greek writer Philostratus, never before transcribed into English. Written in the second century, it revealed an eyewitness account of a giant fossil skeleton exposed by an earthquake on the North Aegean island of Lemnos. I myself sailed over last year to see it. The backbone lay in pieces. The ribs had been wrenched away from the vertebrae. But as I examined the bones, all together and one by one, I got an impression of terrifying size, impossible to describe. The skull alone held more than two Cretan amphoras. Amphoras were wine jugs, and, and a wine jug from Crete held about 20 to 24 liters. So they were measuring the skull capacity at about 40 to 50 liters. And I consulted with some uh, paleontologists in London, and they tell me that that is 
not far off for the cranium of a mastodon from the uh, Pleistocene or Miocene era. How might the ancients, who had never seen an elephant's skull before, have interpreted such a find? Well, they would have seen it from the front, and they would have wondered where the two eyes were, and they wouldn't have seen them, because in a mastodon skull, like a lot of plant eaters, the eyes are at the side. We have a nice round eye socket, and it's very obvious where our eyes are. But for an elephant, and for most mammal skulls, um, there's an opening in the back, and you can't really, you're not sure where the eye is. But there's a big opening in the front, which happens to be the nose opening, but could be viewed as the eye opening. What you'd see is one big hole in the middle, which is actually where the trunk attaches. Of course, a person living thousands of years ago probably wouldn't recognize those as nostrils because they don't look like human nostrils. And so they might have envisioned that this one big hole in the front wasn't the nostril, wasn't where the trunk attaches, but rather is where there was one big eye in the middle. To Mayer, the story immediately brought to mind the epic tale of Odysseus. In it, the ancient poet Homer describes an encounter with a tribe of giants, savage one-eyed cave dwellers strong enough to throw a boulder and sink a passing ship. Though they survived by herding sheep, they hungered for human flesh. Only by plunging a sharpened pole into the monster's eye did Odysseus escape and only after losing four of his men to the gluttony of Polyphemos, the legendary Cyclops, a misshapen giant with a single huge eye in the center of its forehead. Did the ancients view the Mastodon skull as proof the mythical Cyclops actually existed? Those myths about giants and monsters were confirmed every single time some villager would plow up a bone that was as tall as he was. We have no way of proving that myths about giant creatures, uh, about monsters, about uh, huge heroes were actually inspired by the observation of enormous fossil bones. But what we can say is that when people did find bones like this, remarkable remains, they immediately referred them to the myths that they knew. If proof could be found that the ancients actually excavated and examined these gigantic remains, as the written record suggests, it would lend credence to Mayer's seemingly radical theory. But that investigation would require an unprecedented exhumation into ancient graves and new science. The soil of the Aegean was once rich with vast deposits of prehistoric fossils, treasures revealed by the constant earthquakes that broke the rock in which they lay. But did the ancient Greeks recognize their value? The answer may lie in the prophecies of the oracle, mortal women who became possessed by the gods in order to peer into the past and the future. Delegates from every province sought her counsel. Typical is the petition made by representatives of Sparta around 530 BC, recorded by the Greek historian Herodotus. When asked how their town could thrive and triumph over its enemies, the oracle directed them to bring to Sparta the remains of the mythic hero Orestes, son of Agamemnon. According to legend, Orestes had avenged his father's death by killing his mother, an act that caused the Furies to drive him to madness. Cured by sympathetic gods, he became king of Argos and Mycenae, he was said to have lived to an old age, but his burial place was unrecorded. For months, Herodotus wrote, the Spartans searched in vain. Then one day, in the ancient city of Tegea, a Spartan soldier overheard a blacksmith tell a remarkable story. In the course of digging a nearby well, he had made an inexplicable discovery, one he described in detail. While digging in the earth, I found a coffin seven yards long. I couldn't believe there had ever been men that big, so I opened it. I saw that the body inside was that length also. After I measured it, I buried it back again. To the soldier, these gigantic remains could only be one thing, the bones of the hero Orestes. Waiting until nightfall, he dug them up and spirited them back to Sparta. The ancient Greeks believed that in the mythological era, 
all the heroes, uh, heroes and heroines were three times the size of puny men and women of today and that everything was better. I mean, every age believes that there was a golden age, uh, but even the animals were bigger, everything was bigger and better and more spectacular. They thought of the, their heroes, those who preceded them as larger than themselves. Heroism uh, meant that those that were considered larger than life for their deeds would be larger than life in fact. Power indicated height and might. During the century between 500 BC to 400 AD, when the worship of heroes was most active, it was common practice to rebury large bones whenever they were found, with all the ceremony due the remains of heroes. The bones the blacksmith unearthed